Heavenly Father, interesting times that you've brought us to with this uh, pandemic, this economic panic, uh, the things that are happening at this time. And we trust that no one really knows for sure what's going on except you, and no one can really have clear insight about what's happening except through your prophetic word. So as we open your word here this morning, we ask that you'd give us some of the assurance of the fact that you are not taken by surprise by any of this and that the things that we need to know about this current situation you've laid out in your word and we thank you for these things in Jesus name amen it's my hope that the people that are watching this ministry's presentations that they're watching all of them and uh, I'm hoping that you watched Larry's presentation on Sabbath, which was very good, but, and I'm glad he didn't erase his board, because I want to start there. Uh, if you haven't watched, it won't be that beneficial for you, but for those of us that were here on Sabbath, uh, we should be able to pick up right where he was um, ending, uh, and, and allow me to make a couple additions to what he was saying before I get into my material. If you haven't picked up notes, there's notes there. I want to erase this here. I want to use this part here. Um, so I'm going to take some things out of the way um, to just further develop his point. Now, if you remember, he was making a lot of interesting points about uh, Revelation 9, jo Josiah Litch's work in opening up Revelation. Revelation 9, from in the fifth trumpet, there's a 150-year time prophecy. And then there's a 391-year, 15-day time prophecy in the sixth trumpet. But what we were laying out is that here at the sixth trumpet when this 391 year or what he was laying out 391 year 15 day time prophecy is marked in Revelation 9 that you can go back into the prophecy into the verse itself Revelation 9 15 and it speaks about an hour a day a month and a year and if you take it in reverse order okay it, the way it's stated in the Bible, it's a, a day, an hour, a month, and a year. So you would think if you were going to lay that out on a line that you should do it in that order. But if you do it in the reverse order, a year is 360, a month is 30 days, or yeah, a day is a year, and an hour is 15 days. Right? right. Then you find that the historical event that concludes with each of these waymarks, um, how, and I hope you're understanding what we mean by waymarks, I'll make this a continuous line. From here, on July 27, 1299, and that's how Josiah Litch laid it out, you have a 150-year time prophecy that takes you to July 27, 1449. That's Millerite understanding that's what's on these two sacred tables. And then it will, what Josiah Litch came to understand is down here at the end of this 15 days, it takes you to August 11th, 1840. Down here, this way, Mark. Okay, so what we understand now is if we take the actual expression, hour, month, day, year, hour, month, day, year, in Revelation 9.15, that it will create another way mark here, 360 years from when the 391 year, 15 day time prophecy starts, and then 30 years after that, and then one year after that, it creates another waymark right there. These waymarks have historical events associated with those dates, and they're not just a year, they're the 27th of July, whether it's 
Gregorian and Julian, and the events that mark those away marks have to do with Islam, and, and Larry laid that out for us yesterday. So that's a definition of prophecy that this movement has always operated on. Historical events were set before the people, and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. So it's, it's not just that you start here on July 27, 1449, and go 360 years later in order to apply the year of Revelation 9.15, and then you choose the history of that year to say that's what's fulfilled. The history that is there is history that speaks to the very theme of Revelation 9. It's about Islam and Islam's warfare against Rome every time, okay, on each one of these waymarks. That's pretty profound stuff. But what I was saying yesterday after the class and this is what I want to add to it. If you go to Revelation 9, and look at verse 5, and then verse 10, okay? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Why do you have, I see in 150, 360, 31, we get 391. I forget how the, the half is 15, I forget. You know, it's pointing okay, out. Okay, let, let me go to, I'll start okay, sorry. this way. Go to verse 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. Okay, the four angels are loosed right here at this date. You follow me? Okay, Josiah Lich's prediction... Josiah Lich's understanding of this verse um, adds those four time elements up. What is a year? 360. What is a month? What is a day? What is an hour? What's a day? A day is 24. A day is a year. A day is a year. How many hours are in a day? 24. 24 hours in a day. So if you have an hour, it's 1 24th of a year. 1 24th of a year. That's right. Okay, and, and what's 1 12th of a year? One month. 30 days. 30 days, yeah. So a 24th is half of 30. What's half of 30? 15 days. Okay, so that's the calculation here. And at that level, this is, this is the, the basic conclusion years, 15 days, of the Millerites of Josiah Litch from here to here. And this starts on July 27, 1449, and it ends on August 11th, 1840. Right? So what does that tell you? Yeah, well, you can't know what I mean by that, so I'll tell you what it tells me. And, but this might be a problem for some, and rightly so, if they don't have confidence in Palmoni. This isn't where I was going, but I want to put this in the mix. If this is the starting point of this prophecy, when does it start? July 27th, 1449, and it, when does it end? August 11th, 1840. Okay, so what is August 11th? It's July 27th. Okay. Because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. That isn't what, where I was going, but um, it's, it's saying that July 27th is also August 11th. All right, which is, we want to deal with that. We want to put that in place for World War II. But what I want you to see, um, let me make sure that I get this right. Theodore Turner discovered a couple really profound insights prophetically here at the end of the world. One of them was Revelation 9. He came to understand that this being Revelation 9. Okay, and I, now I, I remembered where I wanted to go. Go with me first. Now, I will go to Theodore's discovery. Go with me first to verse 5 
of Revelation 9. It says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion. When he striketh a man, man, how long is five months prophetically? 150 years. So go to verse 10. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. So in Millerite history, they took verse 5 and verse 10 pretty much and said, okay, this is a repeat and enlarge, or it's, it's speaking to the same thing. And they would put verse 5 and 10 right here. Okay, but what Theodore understood, and I'm going to put verse 10 here, Theodore understood, came to recognize that verse 5 is also in this history. Uh, and uh, it begins back here in 632. Um, and there's a 150-year period that takes you to 782. And then there's a, a, a period of 126. And when I'm putting these way marks up here, each one of these histories is a history that deals with Islam in agreement with the theme of Revelation 9. Um, and I'm not necessarily, I'm not trying to take time for that right now. I want to show you something else. This has already been put in the public record by Theodore, by myself, by Odilio and Stephen from this room more than once. But this 126 year period it's followed by another period. How long is that period? Anyone know? Anyone remember? It's 391 years from 908 to here. Okay. So in this whole history, among other things, you've got two 391 year time prophecies. This one's 15 days. Um, you've got two 150s. You see it? What else do you see? And what is, what is it that was confirmed by Lich, by Josiah Lich? I'm just going to put Josiah. What was it that was confirmed that brought power to the Millerite movement with this line of prophecy? The year day principle. So, but. Josiah Litch, the Millerites, they never saw this. They never saw this breakdown here either. All they saw was this. They saw this. This 150. And this 300. That's all they saw. What we saw, see now is all of this. But this is... Um, this, this has an internal... Second witness to it. Do you see the internal second witness? So what happened in 632, 782? I, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. I'll have to dig into the notes, but um, I can remember one off the top of my head. One of them, it, this one or this one, is a, the Treaty of Constantinople, and Constantinople is a subject of this history, because over here, Constantinople is going to be taken out by Islam. For this here is the, the uh, how they say it, not decree. The command of Abu Bakr was in 632. Abu Bakr is the first leader after Muhammad, and Muhammad starts over here in 606. You can see that on the charts. So this is Abu Bakr's command, and where is that in De Revelation 9? That's verse 4. Verse 4 is, hurt not. And that's fulfilled in 632 by Abu Bekr. And then I forget what these two histories are, but one of them is the, the Treaty of Constantinople. Okay? And it's in, our, it's in our material, probably in Odilio's July 18th book. Um, but that's not what I'm getting at. I, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to go to that level. Those, those histories... And Theodore has written about this too. Those histories are sound and you can look them up. I'm wanting you to see something here about 
what the Millerites understood, it ends up with 15 days. Right here, right? 391 years and 15 days, which is a half a month, right? And we haven't even taken time to show how Ezekiel's prophecy is 391 years and a half a year. Ezekiel's prophecy is a half a year. This is a half a day, a half a month. Half a, it's two weeks, a half a month. But what I'm saying, and I, I want you to see, is you have an internal witness in this prophecy, a second witness, that not only confirms the, the, the numerical value of it, but it confirms the year-day principle. What is it? It's right here. Here you have 391 years. That's what you have here. And 150 years. Not 15 days. Not 15 years, because you can drop the zero, right? 15 days. So this history here is a second witness, but it's witnessing here years, not days. It's the same identical pattern. If you drop the zero, which you can do, you bring it over here, and the, the half, the 15, is years, not days. So in this line of prophecy, you've got the identical prophecy, one's emphasizing day, one's emphasizing year. You see it? Okay, so the, the Millerites didn't see that. Okay, they, they didn't see it. Now, um, does everyone remember the prophecy of Josiah in Ezekiel? And they answered not a word. No? Yes? Okay, so what I'm going to do here, I want you to follow me or you'll lose me. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm saying that in Revelation 9, there are two witnesses to 391.15. But the one 15 is days and the other 15 is decades or years. All right, you follow me? Yes? To this 391 year 15. Okay, but really if you want to get it clear in your head, you don't do 15. What would you do? 0.5. Half. This is a half a month. Okay, because in Ezekiel's Josiah prophecy, I'm going to give you a line up on line here, and this is probably where you should start, because Ezekiel comes before Revelation. There's a 391 year prophecy, 0.5, and it's six months here, and it's 0.5, and this would be. 0.5. This is a 0.5 based upon the testimony of these two, but here's my point. Where do we start Ezekiel's prophecy? When does it start? No. I'm looking for the date. 977. What took place in 977? 1 Kings 13. 1 Kings 13. Now, this, this 391 is not preceded by 150. Th this 391 here, you got to watch probably, get this. This 391, this one here, is preceded by a 150. Yes? Okay, and this, this 391 is preceded by a 126. Okay, but the 150 and the 126 are both prophetic numbers. 
And Ezekiel's 391 and a half is preceded by a 120. What's the 120? It's the first three kings. Saul, David, Solomon. Each ruled 40 years. Okay, and I think this goes back to 1027, is it? 10... 1097. Okay, that, that's, not, that's not that big of a deal. It, it, but it's pretty easy to show that a 120 is a 150 if you want to prophetically, but we don't want to do that right now. You know you can show a 150 is a 120, right? Mm -hmm. And a 126, so we're saying all those things. <clears throat> well, if you want to argue that, you probably can now from, from these lines. Okay. But I'm just saying it's pretty well established that a 150 is a 120. Why? Because from 9-11 to the midnight cry is how many days? Based upon Ezra 7-9. First, first, first day of the first month, the first day of the fifth month is how many days? 150. Okay, so 120. 120. But it, at 9-11 is where we start that, right? And what happens to Zechariah at 9-11? He's made dumb. And what does his wife do? She goes into hiding for how long? For five months, 150. And it's at the way mark of the midnight cry where the 120 ends, and it's the, at the way mark of the midnight cry where the 150 ends. Okay, so a 150 is a 120. So Ezra 7, 9, and Zechariah are proofs so of why we can take 120 and 150. And yeah, and there's lots of lines that go on there. I mean, okay. with Ezra 7, 9, you can bring uh, other 120s. Um, how, uh, how old's Moses when he dies? Um, how old is Abraham when he sacrifices Isaac? You know, you can, you, you can bring all kinds of 120s in there. 120, right? Okay, so, um, okay, now f I'm getting off track here. 1 Kings 13, what I'm trying to show here is that the 391 that is pretty standard understanding in Adventism is much more than Adventism understood and what Larry laid out yesterday is it's a phenomenon uh, that is an impossibility mathematically to happen that each of these waymarks would take place on the 26th day of the fourth month which was also the 27th of July and that all the histories would correspond and that you could lay the verse 15 of Revelation 9 in reverse order in here and it fit perfectly. What I've added to that is that in Revelation 9 you also have another 391 that's preceded by a 126 and that it is a 39115. only it's 15 decades, it's years instead of 15 days. But here this is the prophecy of the division of the kingdom. And in 1 Kings 13, we won't spend a lot of time in here because we already all know this. This is a matter of several presentations. Before we get to 1 Kings 13, let's take the last two verses of chapter 12. It says, So Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto calves that he ma had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of, high pla of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Verse 1, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar. This is the disobedient prophet. And he's rebuking Jeroboam. Who is Jeroboam? He's the king of the ten northern tribes. It's setting up a counterfeit worship after Solomon's son, 
divides the kingdom through his rebellious attitude to into north and south. So there's a counterfeit worship taking place here. And for some reason, in the last two verses of chapter 12, in verse 32 and 33, for some reason, God emphasizes the date that this took place. What date did it take place? It, it's, it's not August 15th. There's no Gregorian calendar back in the history of Jeroboam. The 15th day of the 8th month. The the eighth month. What's the 15th day of the 8th month, my brother? August 15. August 15th. What's August 15th a symbol of? Midnight. So this is a midnight cry. Is it not? It's the 15th day of the 8th month. So when you get to the time period of the midnight cry, the time period of the midnight cry is what we're in now, what will you see? A counterfeit system, religious system set up. And there's going to be a true religious system in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem in relation to Israel is what? It's the minority. It's the, Israel's the majority. They're the ten. Jerusalem's the two. Okay, so not only is there going to be a counterfeit of the midnight cry message when the midnight cry message arrives, but if you want to know which side to be on, go for the minority every time. Okay, the majority is the counterfeit. And so this begins what? This begins the divided kingdom. And by the time you get down here to um, 723, the northern kingdom's carried into captivity. Um, and then by the time you get down here, Manasseh is going to get carried to Babylon, but he's going to come back. And where is it that the last king of Judah is going to see his children slain? and then have his eyes put out. It's down here in 586. Right? Yes? Yes, it is. 977 to 586 is how many years? It's 391 years. Okay, but in the same year, there's a six month period here that's marked off. This is 587 crosses over. So what is this history then? It's the history of the divided kingdom. It disregarded the first three kings when the kingdom was united. Solomon, David, or Saul, David, and Solomon. From this symbol of the midnight cry, till Jerusalem is destroyed is 391 years and 15 days. Okay, so what's that tell you? Uh, well, one thing it tells you is what I should have done is I should have did it this way. I'm going to do it this way so we can get the Okay. Okay, this is the midnight cry. This is the destruction of Jerusalem. If you were to do it this way, if you would do it this way, right. where well, there is a Sunday law at the midnight cry, yeah, I know, which Sunday law is it? The destruction of Jerusalem is the Sunday law. Yeah, the real, the real Sunday law. Okay, but if I did it this way, and I put 9-11 here, and I put the midnight cry here, then you'd have a Sunday law here. Okay. But why would I put 9-11 to here? What's my justification for saying that this would be the midnight cry? Ezra 7-9. Right? 
first day of the first month, Ezra leaves Babylon. And where does he get on the first day of the fifth month? He gets to Jerusalem. Okay, so what is this here in 586? This is Jerusalem. It's the destruction of Jerusalem. But it's still Jerusalem as a waymark. Okay, so if this is Jerusalem, and this is Jerusalem when Ezra gets to Babylon on the first day, or gets to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month in 457 BC, when was that fulfilled in Millerite history? August 15th, 1844. That's right where this starts. Eighth month, 15th day. Over here, it's the 8th month, 15th day. It's the destruction of Jerusalem. It's Ezra arriving at Jerusalem. It's 120 is, is this history in the story of Ezra. Are you all following me? Yeah, but I have a question. I'm, 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 go for it. Because you just laid out 120, 150, and 126 as preceding this 391, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so now you're saying that this 120 is actually the 391. No, I'm not. Um, you can say that if you want. I'm just bringing another line. I'm, I'm not trying to bring that kind of confusion into it. But if you, yeah, you can see that. You could, you could argue that this is um, a 391 if you want to. But that's not where I'm going. If you want to prove that on a few witnesses on your own time, go ahead. You would need to see 391 following this history that you've given of the Midnight Cry? I'm saying that right here, at Jeroboam's dedication at Bethel and Dan, what's Bethel? House of God. House of God. What's Dan? Judgment. Judgment. What is it? What's it symbolize? The judgment of the House of God. It, rep it represents two cities. What's two cities? Bible prophecy is cities and kingdoms, so it's two kingdoms. Anyone going to get involved? If it's two kingdoms, what is it? It's two horns. Yeah. What's the two horns of the United States? Protestantism, Republicanism. Bethel is Protestantism. Dan is Republicanism. Okay, church and state. Church and state. So... Here, with Bethel and Dan, you have church and state represented. And you know it's the midnight cry. Oh, you got two internal witnesses that it's the midnight cry that I read for you. What are the two internal witnesses? Oh, altar, altar. Oh, altar, altar is one. And the, the 815. So this is the midnight cry. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. So this is going to be the midnight cry. This is going to be Jerusalem, and this is the midnight cry in our history. And what do we understand about what happens at the midnight cry in our history? What test begins? Image. The image of the beast test. What's the only definition given in inspiration of the image of the beast? Combination of Bethel and Dan, with Bethel in control of the relationship. Okay, so... Here you've got, you've got the image of the beast at this midnight cry, image of the beast at this midnight cry. These two lines, these three lines, these four lines. <laughs> With these four lines now, you can begin to deduce things. And there's more lines to bring on it. What can you deduce by this? Well, I would argue that um, here, where this 391 years begins, of Revelation 9, um, 15 days, that begins right here, that this July 27th, says that July 27th is going to be the last way mark. Right? Okay, Jesus illustrates then from the beginning, if this 391 
year, 15 days, begins on July 27th, then as a symbol, July 27th would be here. But you would have to have what? In order for a symbol to be established as a symbol, what do you have to have? Two or three witnesses. Do you have two or three witnesses in this history? You have five. Five witnesses that July 27th is a symbol. So a symbol that's here at the beginning of this 391 is going to be down here at the end of this 391. But with these other lines, this is saying that this is the midnight cry. It's combination of church and state. This would be the midnight cry, combination of church and state. That's what I'm saying. You can begin to deduce things by these lines that begin to shed light upon our history. What is this here? This six months. It's the siege of Jerusalem. There's going to be a siege that leads to the midnight cry. Okay, so is everyone following me on this? Let me make sure that we put everything in place. Um, let me show you one other thing. I'll move over here. I probably won't remember all these things. Go ahead. Question, if we're labeling the midnight cry as a combination of church and state, how do we translate that into what the Millerites were doing during their midnight cry? How is that a combination of church and state? Oh. Well, well, probably, and it's just a probably, um, if you're going to go into the history of Samuel Snow, which is their midnight cry, and I haven't had this question, I don't think, so I haven't thought it through, but when does Samuel Snow's message begin to, begin to be present truth? Okay. What is his message? It's a message of the midnight cry. Where's his primary point of reference? The cross. But yeah, his primary point of reference is the cross. I, I don't know. I'm not asking this question well. So I'll just say it. He, he, the... The Lord had to remove his hand for, in that history from a certain truth. What was that? The fullness of year. Okay, so when did that take place? On the first day of the first month. Right? April 19th, 1844. The year 1843 had passed. Now you're at the first day of 1844. Now what Samuel Snow's saying is, is important. And this is... This is what's going to be the seventh month movement, right? Beginning on April 19th. That's why they call it the seventh month movement. It's going to go to the tenth day of the seventh month. So Snow's message at that level, if it's okay to define it that way, on April 19, 1844, his message, I don't know if you can say empowered, but now he, he's got the proof. It isn't 1843, it's 1844. You know, he has to figure out where the cross is and some other things. What happened here? Prophetically, what happened here? Disappointment. Disappointment? What, uh, what, this, this is more obscure. When I'm asking what happened here, we don't, uh, we don't talk about this as much as we used to. Right here, the Protestant horn is conquered. They've rejected Miller's, fully rejected William Miller's first angel's message. This is the Protestant horn. So in Samuel Snow's message at the beginning of Adventism, the Protestant horn is conquered. And it's part of the, it's the, one of the primary waymarks to the message of the midnight cry. When does the Republican horn get conquered? And don't give me any of Parminder's and Tess's foolishness. 9-11. At 9-11, the Republican horn gets conquered. Okay? So that's Bethel and Dan there on a larger scale. And it, that is I'm just saying, uh, what I'm answering your question is, is that in Millerite history, half the story was is when Bethel got conquered, when the church got conquered, and at the end of Adventism in our history of the midnight cry, the Republican horn gets conquered. Okay, and the, and the, the historical event that marked that was the Patriot Act. This is 9-11. And that's the first day of the first month, and it begins this, this line here. Yes? Amen. Okay, so, yeah, that's the midnight cry. It means that what we're saying about these two horns is part of this message. 
right? So I, I'm going to do something totally different now, switch gears, but I'm going to do it off the top of my head. Um, can someone look up, I meant to do this, I meant to have it in our notes. <laughs> We're not going to get to these notes in this presentation. Can you look up where Jesus says, um, he was asked how many times you forgive a brother, and he says 70 times 7. Um, and let's do it this way. Matthew 18, Would someone read Matthew 18.22? Jesus, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I got challenged on this when we first recognized this, when Jesus says seventy times seven. And what's seventy times seven? And what I, I forget the argument that was thrown my way. But what I concluded, and this is worth looking at, every single place in the New Testament where there is a numerical expression like this, 70 times 7, it is never expressed that way. Ever. This is the only place where you're going to see 70 times 7. You go look at any other numerical expression. This is singular. You mean multiplication. Yes. There are other multiplications set forth in the New Testament, but they're never expressed that way. This is... This is times, you mean? What I'd have to go in and dig it out for you, but my point is, is this, this is more than simply Christ talking off the top of his head. He's laying out the 490 years. What's the 490 years? When does the 490 years begin? Four fifty-seven. And when's it go to? Thirty-four. Thirty-four. Yeah, that's weeks. seventy weeks. Okay, that's Daniel nine. So we know from here and from Daniel nine that the number four ninety represents what? Probationary time yeah. or? You know, how long God suffers with rebellion, however you want to express it. This is what Jesus says. You forgive him 70 times 7, but at the end of 490, you cut him off. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened here. So I'm saying that 490 is a symbol, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I need some other witnesses. This 457, what decree is it in 457 that starts this time prophecy? Third decree. So there's three decrees. This is the three decrees. One, two, three. What is the first prophecy that's in the 490 years? Should we read it? We shouldn't have to read it as Seventh-day Adventists. We should know this. What is the first prophecy in the 2300-year prophecy? Okay, so uh, read it for me. 457. The streets and walls are going to be built in troublous times, are they not? Yes, yes. After how long? Three score and two. Uh -uh. No, no. Okay, the, the verse says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the So what is seven weeks? It's seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The first prophecy is seven weeks. It's 49 years. Yeah. And what happens at the end of 49 years? The streets and the walls. I'm just going to put streets up there. Are built in troublous times. Who did that? Nehemiah. How, when, when Nehemiah fulfills this waymark right here, 
How many days does it, does it take him to do the, do the work? Somebody said 52. How many believe 52? I think I heard a, a quiet, muffled 52. Hey, what is that? Is that Nehemiah 6.15? Go to Nehemiah 6.15. How many believe it was 52 days? Okay, it wasn't 52 days, but that's all right. What, someone want to read Nehemiah 6.15? Six fifteen. Anyone there? And uh, so the wall was finished in the seventh and fiftieth. I'm sorry, sorry, in the twentieth and fifth day of the month, Elul, in the in fifty and two days. Okay, so it's finished in fifty-two days. That's what our brother's claiming, but I want to point out. There's a story about Nehemiah. This is the 52 days here. When Nehemiah comes to do the work, what does he first do? He goes around the, he goes around the town. When? Midnight. On what? On, a, on an ass. On an ass. Yeah. He takes an ass and he goes on a midnight circuit to check out Jerusalem, how many days is he doing this investigation? Two, three. 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 One, two, three. There's those three decrees. So how long does it actually take him to do the work? Why do, what does Sister White says, say about his need to do this three-day circuit? He's going to give a revival and reformation sermon on day one of these 49 days and she says had he not had a genuine familiarity with well this part of the wall is broken down there and this is missing there that he couldn't have inspired the people so he had to have these three days in his pocket before he could be used by the Lord to inspire the people to finish the work in 49 days so yeah it's 52 but do you see that this way mark here, this way mark here, where the streets and walls get built in troublous times, they're identical to the beginning of the 457 prophecy. He had to secure the three decrees, basically. He had to secure all yeah, the Yeah, those three days are the three decrees. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It, but what's it teaching us? What's it teaching us? You've got to see this. this. This may be hard for me to share where you can conceptualize this. The first prophecy in the 2300 year prophecy has a beginning and an ending. Okay, the beginning's here. Three decrees and then 49 years. Yes? But when the 49 years, when it's time for this to be fulfilled, you have three days and 49 days. So you have the end, this is the end, I don't know how to say it, this is the end up here that has been end, that has been illustrated by the beginning. Do you see it? The beginning of the prophecy, it sets forth this 349 ratio, and when it's time for that prophecy to be fulfilled, there's a 349 ratio that's fulfilled by Nehemiah. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So, is it okay to put a zero on that? Yeah. So this 49 years here begins with three decrees and this 490 years begins with three decrees. This 49 is also 490. Are you buying that? Because if you are buying that, what it's teaching you is that 490 is a symbol of probationary time. 49, therefore, is a symbol of probationary time. Yes? Yeah. What happens at the end of this history with Nehemiah and Ezra? They're closing the probation on those Jews that wouldn't participate in the work, that wouldn't, that wouldn't turn loose of their heathen wives, that still wanted to sail on the Sabbath. 
right? So there's probation closing down here at the hand of the 49. And I'm saying that we're teaching that 49, 490 can be 49 by just dropping the zero. Okay, I need a, probably another witness. So William Shea, a theologian that may very well have been laid to rest by now, for all I know, um, and who would never support anything that we teach, I'm certain, he teaches that the first place in the scriptures that you find the year-day principle, it's not numbers, uh, or it's, where is it? Genesis, no, it's in Exodus 20. Um. Exodus 20 has the Sabbath commandment, okay, set forth. And he teaches that's the first place you're going to find it. Why? Because it's going to get its second witness to uphold it where? In Leviticus 25. Okay, so if you take Leviticus 25 and put it with Exodus 20, you have a 2520, but that's not what I'm getting at. In order, it'd be a 2025, but what is Leviticus 25 that William Shea points to? <clears throat> Do you remember? Okay, he identifies, I, I want to think this through how I line this up. Let's just do it over here and then I'll try to pull it in. He says that in the Sabbath commandment, you have six days and then the seventh day, this is the seventh day, is the Sabbath. But in Leviticus 25, now you're going to have a Sabbath rest for the land. Six years. This is a day. This is a year. This is the rest for man. This is the rest for the land. And uh, this is a day, this is a year. And then what's the land supposed to be allowed to do in the seventh year? Rest for one year. But in Leviticus 25, it goes a step further, doesn't it? What's it do? It says that, and I can probably do this over here, that after seven sevens, and what's seven sevens? You have 49 years. Now the, the land is to have a jubilee of rest in the 50th year, which is also the 49th year, by the way. But it takes place. When's the trumpet of the jubilee blown? Uh, on the Day of Atonement, 10th day of the seventh month in the 49th year. Okay, so anyway, we got another 49 here. You know any more 49s? I'll give you another 49. And this one starts with three. What is it? Okay, this is the cross. Oh, 50 for Pentecost. And, and this is when he rests in the tomb. I'm just going to put this for resting in the tomb. This is the resurrection. And then you count how many days? 49 days takes you to where? Pentecost. And in Acts of the Apostles, Sister White says that when Christ began his work in the heavenly sanctuary, he poured out the Spirit on Pentecost as a token to his followers that um, his offering had been received and that he began his work. And what did she say took place in heaven at that point in time? She says there was a jubilee. Over here, there's a, when this land resting is repeated seven times, which is 49 years, then you have a jubilee here in the 49th slash 50th year. This jubilee lines up with this jubilee, lines up with the 49 days between the the, the resurrection and Pentecost, 
which lines up with, I don't know what I have that, what was that? 49. Anyway, are you following the 49s? So I'm saying that this is a probationary time because you said it, right? If 490 is probationary time, Leviticus 25. So what's this? This is a uh, cross. All right, so what I'm saying is that we have lots of evidence that the 49 takes us to a jubilee. There's lots of things you can show with this, but that the 49 is a 490, okay? It's a close of probation here for those people that wouldn't be involved with the work. And at the beginning of this 490 year prophecy up here, there's a close of probation here for the people that wouldn't get involved with the work, the Jewish church. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. So the beginning of this prophecy is illustrating the end of this prophecy. Everyone with me? And in the first prophecy of this history, the beginning of this prophecy is illustrating the end of this prophecy. So it's really a complex piece of information. But so too with the year-day principle here of the Sabbath rest for man and the Sabbath rest for the land, when you take the Sabbath rest from the land and turn it into the Jubilee cycle, then you're showing that the Jubilee takes place in this 49th slash 50th year and it lines up with this 49 slash 50 Pentecost. You with me? Okay, so this gives us, and I'm probably forgetting some, one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you're willing to see it, but let's just leave it at six. Six witnesses that 490 is a probationary time. Right? Yeah. So, what probation ended in 1789? You didn't know I was going to go there. <laughs> yeah, you did, huh? No, that's 1798. There's a 490 before that. I forget. There's a 490 here. And when does it begin? It begins in 1299. What's 1290 and 490? 1789. Okay, but when does it be begin? July 27th. You have it over here. Yes. July 27th, 1299, in the Julian. In the Julian. Brings you to 1789. And what happened on July 27th? 1789 in the Gregorian. The State Department was formed. There, there has to be a connection. Why? You got two internal witnesses. I'm asking a question. Even if you don't know what the connection is, you should know what the answer is. Why does there have to be a connection? July 27th. There's one witness at the beginning and the ending. What's the other witness? 490. 490. This period of time has to mean something. Right? Okay, so what is this? The formation of the State Department. The beginning of their probationary time. A beginning of their probationary time? The, well, that, that's kind of where I was wanting you to go, the beginning of their probationary time. But what is this? This is the midnight cry. Isn't it? Why is that the midnight cry? 
because this is the midnight cry. I got you to agree at the very beginning that if this, this prophecy here of 391 years begins on July 27th, then even though we know it ends on August 11th, August 11th has to be typified by July 27th. And August 11th, by the way, that isn't, that's not August 15th, is it? That's August 11th, 1840. August 11th is simply what, what took place. The Ottoman Empire's supremacy ceased. Okay, it's a, it's a restraint placed upon Islam on August 11th, 18th. So it's about Islam. Is this about Islam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see what Yeah, it's going. Islam. So you've got to have Islam down here. But, but here, if this is the arrival, is this the arrival of the United States as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy? Yeah, they're not really actually even going to be the Sixth Kingdom until 1798, but this is the beginning. This is the beginning. And if this is the beginning of the United States, what's it tell you? It's that the the at the end, at the end, the State Department's going to come to an end. So 9 11 is where <laughs> no, 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 July 27. 9 11's got to be part of the story. 9-11's got to be part of the story. But what is this story? What have we already put in the record here in this ministry? What takes place between the midnight cry and the Sunday law? Lots of things take place. This is the end of what kingdom? The sixth kingdom, the United States. And this is the rise of what kingdom? Seven. The seventh kingdom. The midnight cry is marking the end, the ending, it's progressive, it's not a point in time, of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And its end is the dissolution, so to speak, of the State Department. What, is, what does a State Department for every, any country represent? It's, it's national sovereignty. It's not being ruled by any other governments. It's its own sovereign authority that began here in 1789. Right here. The sovereign authority of the United States is going down as it's getting enveloped into the United Nations, the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy. Why does it go down? Because of the Sunday law. I would say... It oh, has oh, yeah, to be okay. from Islam. Yeah. What would this be? It would be, I don't know if they had, Larry, you, you were talking about chiastic structures on Sabbath. Are there chiastic structures that aren't perfect mathematically? So this can't be that, they, they can't be. But this begins with Islam, a probationary time, and it's identifying a probationary time that ends at the midnight cry but the element of time doesn't fit. So what I'm saying is, July 27th is not only about Islam, it's about the beginning of the fall of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And I'm saying that July 27th is Panium But what, which panium? Uh -uh. When did panium for the United States begin? Panium for the United States began on when was Rafia for the United States? Uh -uh. Okay, now you guys, we got to keep up with the The logic, okay? Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And all the lines that are in Daniel's last vision, which is chapter 10, 11, and 12, there are three primary bad lines. Who is it? The dragon, the beast, the false prophet. 
they all have their own story that they're structured on. What's the story of the dragon? King of the South. What's the story of the beast? Fatima. What's the story of the false prophet? Constitution. In those stories, what two antagonists are always there? Liberals versus conservatives. Always there. Who's the liberal conservative in the story of the King of the South? It's Putin and Trump. Who's the liberal and conservative in the story of Fatima? Black Pope and the White Pope. Black Pope, White Pope. Who's the liberal and conservatives in the Constitution? Liberal. Republicanism, Liberal. Protestantism. Democrats. Okay, now this is the king, although... Not Protestantism, did you say that? Republics and Democrats. Republicanism, Republic, Republicans Democrats. and Democrats. Democrats and Republicans. Okay, the dragon is the king. Who's the king? The king's Ahab. He's the king, but he's not really the king. Who's the, really the king? Jezebel. Jezebel. What is she? She's a priestess of the Midianite religion. She's the priest of Baal. And she has some false prophets. Okay, so pro priest, I, I can't, uh, prophets. They both start with... Okay, so in... The other kingdom that's in this history is the kingdom of the 144,000. That's us. 144,000. What's our story? Our story is structured on three elements. Prophet. Jesus was a prophet. Priest. Jesus was the priest. And he was the king. So all of these three external lines connect with the internal lines. This is external. This is internal. Okay, I've led you around to try to remind you when it comes to when it comes to Raphia and Paneum. Where's Raphia and Paneum played out for the United States? played out between what two elements? Mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans. What are they fighting over? The Constitution. The conservative element loses the first battle. Trump is the conservative element. He got impeached, he got impeached when? He got acquitted. That was Paneum. Two five twenty. Twenty five twenty is Paneum for the story of the Constitution. And was it December twenty first? Twenty one. That was Rafia. The Democrats passed the Articles of Impeachment. He was acquitted there, based upon where I'm trying to get to and I didn't get to. When the very first time that we saw Paneum, several things we identified were going to happen. Give me two. Panic. 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 Yep, Pandora's box has been opened. Yeah. Wall Street panic. What are we calling this pandemic? Yeah. Did that start after 2 5? Yeah, it did. Okay, but the real pandemic is still ahead. Or there's another pandemic ahead that we mark at the midnight cry. What is that? This Paneum Raphia takes place in the story of the false prophet that is the counterfeit of what? The true, the true prophet. That'd be this. Mm -hmm. What is the story of the true prophet that the story of the 144,000 are structured upon? Elijah. 
in that story, Elijah loses the first battle. When was that battle? 11 9 2019. Is that not their offering? Yeah. Tess and Parminder had over 20 predictions that did not come to pass on November 9th. What's our prediction? July 18th. That's Paneum. What happens on July 18th? This, is, this here, what's going on right now, is a harbinger of what happens on July 18th. Pandemonium, panic, pandemic, uh, pantheon, temple, pantheism, Pandora's box. I know we already know this, but I'm going to say it a little bit, maybe a different way, I think. It seems like, to me, the, the battles, in each battle, you know, you know Panium and, and Raphia, it's, and I know we understand the, the internal, external thing, but it, I think it works, there's like several steps that go from the internal to the external. You have this movement. Then it goes a little bit wider into, you have the Democrats and the Republicans, and a little bit wider the, uh, the, the, uh, between the United States and, other, uh, and Russia. But it works that way, if you understand. If you understand. It's like a stone was dropped into a pool and each yes. main cone, I can see that. Yeah. It starts and just kind the of ripples. Moves. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. ripple effect. What's the Rafi opinion for the King of the South? The, before the papacy, the one hour. You're guessing. Yeah. You're Didn't your guessing. daddy ever teach you that if you don't, don't know, don't yeah. guess because you're teaching your mind, oh, yeah. possibly teaching your mind error, unless you get just lucky and get it right. Okay. What's Raphia and Paneum for the story of the king of the south? Let, let's put it this way. When does the king of the south come to its end? The king of the south being Russia. December 25th. 2021. Okay. 12, 25, 2021. Is Paneum for Russia? Okay, and at that point, Pandora's box is going to be opened. And what takes place here? A Sunday law, and in Revelation 13, 13, Revelation 13, 13, two verses after the Sunday law, what happens? Satan appears to personate Christ. If you think the pandemic and the panic that we have right now is bad, it's going to be worse here at 718. But when you get to the Sunday law, it's going to be absolutely out of control. So what is Raphia? What's the battle of Raphia in the story of the King of South? The United States defeating Russia. Uh, I mean, they're defeated here. Yes. Did they win the first battle? It wins by the weapons it gives to the Islamists to attack. When did they do it? July 18th. 7, 18, 20, 20. Which is a Sunday law. A little Sunday law. Image of the beast testing time. What is the Rafi and the Paneum for the beast? In the story of Fatima. I'm going to say we don't see it. Because she's forgotten until the Sunday law. She's forgotten. There is a line. There is a line here with Fatima that we need to understand. And I'll tell you what the line is in closing, because I'm way over time. This is the line that we need to understand. It's, this, it's the line of Fatima. The line of Fatima, there's essentially three popes. First pope, he's conservative. Second pope, he's conservative. Third pope is the one that's there now. 
He's the Jesuit, first Jesuit pope, liberal. Okay, there's an internal that parallels this. What's the internal that we put in the public record almost immediately after September 7th? Three mud puddles. When did the Omega apostasy begin? 2013 slash 14. <clears throat> Who was the first ministry to um, oppose the message while professing to be in the movement? Is that their name now? No. They changed their name. They made a different covenant. They changed their name. Okay, they made a covenant with death. All right, they're dead. First Pope's dead. Okay. Did they contribute to the midnight cry? Yes. Yes. Ezra 7, 9. This is a trick question here. This is the first mud puddle. It was cluttered. Had some, tr had some great light in it. What's the second mud puddle? December 17th, 2016. It's Raphia and Paneum. Who was there? I'll tell you what. Everyone that was there other than myself, everyone that was there other than myself is in the Omega Apostasy. Every single person that was there. And the, the primary champion during that time period, I've called him the soldier. Yes, right. The soldier. This is Rafi and Paneum, the light that come out, R and P. Is he what you would call a conservative or a Pharisee? Yes, yeah. he was, was the path of the just conservatives? Yeah. Yep. Yes. What's the third piece of light? It was the light on November 9th in the chronology. And who was there for that one? P and T. Are they conservative? No. They're liberal. They're liberal. Yes, that's the thing. There's, there's people that say, I know that he is a very strict, he has the ability to be very regimented, but that's a Jesuit attribute. His stated philosophy is socialism. Yeah. It's communism. He's a Jesuit. Or even if he's not a Jesuit, he has the fruits of the Jesuits. So you have two conservatives followed by a liberal, that's Fatima. The story of Fatima, yeah. Pope John Paul II is a conservative, but he dies, covenant of death. But then the Pope that went into retirement, he's still alive, but he's a conservative too. And the Pope that is now ruling is the liberal. So I'm saying there is a s important story, internal, external, from Fatima, but I don't think it's about Rafi and Paneum. Rafi and Paneum, the external are the dragon and the false prophet. And it's reflected here in the story of the prophet, Elijah. And it will be reflected here in the story of King David and the sanctuary. Yes. <clears throat> Have you looked at the idea that, that Islam has its own... Um, line like we've done for all these, that it's got its own raffia and pineum within Islam, because isn't it its own character, does its own work? No, have you? No. But I've argued already a couple times, more than once, that Rafi and Pinium come from Daniel's last vision, verses 11 through 15 of Daniel 11 is where you're going to find Rafi and Pinium. And you're really only going to see two verses in Daniel's last vision that will intimate in any way Islam. One is verse 30 for ships of Kittim. And only because we know Kittim is Cyprus and we know it's Genseric, we can make a, 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 a real long drawn connection. And the other one is tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him. So we got the east. You really don't have any specific line of Islam in Daniel's last vision. You do have it because the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. 
Okay, so Revelation is going to tell you about Islam in a big way, a thorough way. That's this up here. Okay, very thorough way. But Rafi and Paneum are Daniel's last vision. I don't know that you should be looking for a Rafi and Paneum with Islam. It's connected, but it's different. But if you see it, let me know. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're amazed at what's happening right now around planet Earth. We wonder how much of it is manufactured by human beings behind the scenes. But it seems obvious that um, as the story of Pandora's box is, that even if human beings open the box, that now things are outside of their control, uh, running away from their ability to control them. And you've given us warning since the time period of Sister White that we should be in the country prepared to ride out this coming storm out of the cities, growing our own food. And uh, it's clear to see that that would be the best place to be at this time. Uh, we ask that you'd give us wisdom and discernment how to rapidly bring our lives into agreement with what's about to take place on planet Earth. And we thank you that, that you're doing so through the light of your prophetic word. Please continue to bless and guide, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.